Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The apostle in these words resumes his former exhortation, mentioned in verse 11, and presses it with a new force from that more particular discovery which he gives of the enemy, verse 12, where, like a faithful scout, he makes a full report of Satan's great power and menace, and also discloses what a dangerous design he hath upon the saints, no less than to despoil them of all that heavenly, from all which he gives them a second alarm and bids them, Alarm, alarm, wherefore take unto you, etc. In the words, consider. First, the exhortation with the inference. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Secondly, the argument with which he urges the exhortation, and that is double. First, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Secondly, having done all to stand that is, both able to fight and able to conquer. As for the first general, the exhortation, we shall waive it as to the substance of it, being the same with what we have handled. Verse 11. Only there are two observables which we shall lightly touch, the one from the repetition of the very same exhortation so soon, one verse only inter interposed, the other from the verb the Apostle uses here, which being not the same with verse 11, affords a different note. There is the word used in Greek for put in verse 11, and here in verse 13, the Greek word for take. Chapter 1. The reason why the Apostle renews the same exhortation and also what truths ministers are often to preach to their people. First, of the first, the repetition of the same exhortation, and that in so short a space. Sure it was not for want of matter, but rather out of abundancy of zeal, that he harps the second time on the second string. Indeed, he is the better workman, who drives one nail home with reiterated blows, than he which covets to enter many, but fastens none. Such preachers are not likely to reach the conscience, who hop from one truth to another, but dwell on none. Every hearer is not so quick as the preacher to take a notion as it is first darted forth. Neither can many carry away so much of that sermon, which is made up all of varieties, where a point is no sooner named but presently pulls back its hand, and another makes a breach and comes forth before the first hath been opened and hammered upon the conscience by a powerful application, as where the discourse is homogeneal, and some one necessary truth is cleared, insisted on, and urged home with blow upon blow. Here the whole matter of the discourse is akin and one part remembered brings the memory acquainted with the other, whereas in the former one puts out the other in a weak memory. Short hints and away may please a scholar, but not so profitable for others. The one more fit for the schools, but the other for the pulpit. Were I to buy a garment in a shop, I should like him better that lays one good piece or two before me, that are for my turn, which I may fully examine, than him who takes down all his shop and heaps piece upon piece, merely to show his store. Till at last for variety I can look attentively on none. They lie so one upon another. Again, as it is profitable thus to insist on truths, so it is not be unbecoming a minister to preach the same truths again and again. Paul here goes over and over the same exhortation, verse 11 and 13, and elsewhere tells us this is not 
grievous to him. But to them it is safe to hear the same thing over and over. Philippians 3.1 There are three sorts of truths must in our ministry be preached off. First, fundamental truths, or as we call them, catechism points that contain truths necessary to be known and believed. The weight of the whole building lies on these ground cells more than on superstructural truths. In a kingdom, there are some staple commodities and trades without which the commonwealth could not subsist as wool, corn, etc. in our country. And these ought to be encouraged above others, which, though they be an ornament to the nation, yea, add to the riches of it, yet are not so necessary to the subsistence of it. Thus, here, there is an excellent use of our other ministerial laborers as they tend to beautify and adorn, yea, enrich the Christian with the knowledge of spiritual mysteries, but that which is chiefly to be regarded is the constant faithful opening of those main truths as the gospel. These are the landmarks and show us the bounds of truth, and as it is in towns that about one upon another, if the inhabitants do not sometimes perambulate and walk the bounds to show the youth what they are when the old studs are gone, the next generation may lose all their privileges by their encroaching neighbors because not able to tell what is their own. There is no fundamental truth but hath some evil neighbor, heresy I mean, butting on it. And the very reason why a spirit of error hath so encroached of late years upon truth is because we have not walked the bounds with our people in acquainting them with and establishing their judgments on these fundamental points so frequently and carefully as it requisites. And the people are so much in fault because they cast so much contempt upon their work that they count a sermon on such points next to loss and only child's meat. Secondly, those truths are oft to be preached whose ministers observe to be most undermined by Satan and his instruments in the judgments or lives of their people. The preacher must read and study his people as diligently as any book in his study, and as he finds them, dispense like a faithful steward upon them. Paul takes notice that the Galatians had been in ill handling by false apostles who had, had ever bewitched them back to the law in that great point of justification, and see how he beats upon that point. Our people complain, we are so much, so oft reproved in the same error or sin, that the fault is their own because they will not leave it. Who will blame the dog for continuing to bark when the thief is all the while in the yard? Alas, alas, it is not once or twice rousing against sin will do it. When people think the minister shows his laziness because he preaches the same things, he may then be exercising his patience in continuing to exhort and reprove those who oppose waiting if at last God will give them repentancy to the acknowledging of the truth. We are bid to lift up our voice like a trumpet. And would you have us cease while the battle lasts or sound a retreat when it should be a battle? Thirdly, truths of daily use and practice. These are like bread and salt. Whatever else is on, these must be on the board every meal. St. Peter was of this mind. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them. He had, you may see, then speaking of such graces and duties that they could not pass a day without the exercise of them, and therefore will be ever their monitor, monitor stir up their pure minds about them. All is not well when a man is weary of his ordinary food and nothing will go down but rarities. The stomach is sickly when a man delights rather to pick some salad than eat a solid meat. And how far the this dainty age is gone and this spiritual disease. I think few are so far come to themselves as yet to consider and lament. O oh, souls, be not weary as in doing, so not in hearing those savory truths preached you have daily use of, because ye know them and have heard them often. Faith and repentancy will be good doctrine to preach and hear to the end of the world. 
you may as well quarrel with God because he hath made but one heaven and one way to it, as he offended at the preacher for preaching these over and over. If thy heart be humble and thy palate spiritual, old truths will be new to thee every time thou hearest them. In heaven the saints draw all their wine of joy, as I may so say, at one tap and shall to all eternity, and yet it never tastes flat. God is that one object their souls are filled with and never weary of. And can anything of God and his love be wearisome to thee and the hearing here? I am not all this while an advocate for any loiterer in the Lord's vineyard, for any slothful servants in the work of the gospel, who wraps up his talent in idleness or buries it in the earth. Where may be he is digging and playing the worldling all the week, and then hath nothing to set before his people on the Lord's day, but one or two moldy loaves, which were needed many years before. This is not the good steward. Here is the old, but where are the new things which he should bring out of his treasure? If the minister labors not to increase his stock, he is the worst thief in the parish. It is wicked for a man, trusted with the improvement of orphans' estates, to let them lie dead by him, much more for a minister not to improve his gifts, which I may call the town stock given for the good of the souls of both rich and poor. If that preacher was wise, Ecclesiastics 12.9, who still taught the people knowledge, that is, was ever going on, endeavoring to build them higher in knowledge, and that he might did give good heed, and sought out, and set in order many proverbs, then surely he will be proved a foolish preacher at last, that wastes his time in sloth, or spends more of it in studying how to add to his estate out of his people's, than how to add to their gifts and graces by a conscientious endeavor to increase his own. End of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, chapter 1. I have been read by Peter John Parisi's. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.